I want to begin this morning's lesson with an apology. Um, I'm sorry for going over time as much as I did last Sunday. Uh, it was the worst ever. I looked up and it was quarter till and I said, you have got to be kidding me. And so uh, I got so wrapped up because these four lessons on the relationship between faith and tradition and culture is something that I have been immersed in for 42 years. And I've had my own journey and learning curve in all of this. And uh, this, this just is an amazing topic. And I just appreciate you being patient uh, as we try to work through this. And this morning, I'm going to watch the clock, and I'm going to try to be done as quickly as I can, not keep you over that long. The lesson this morning, it's, it's number four in our series. What do we need to know about our own restoration movement? When I say restoration movement, I'm referring to about the year 1809 when uh, church historians call it the first indigenous religious movement in America. And out of that movement have come Churches of Christ, Christian churches and disciples of Christ. All three of those church traditions come out of that background. Every church stands in two streams of tradition at once. There's the great stream of Christian tradition for almost 2,000 years. And right now I'm reading a new book that has come out. I want to recommend it to you by William Bennett. You may know him as a writer. On He's written other things about uh, virtues and morals and, and, and a couple other books. But he has a book that just came out and it's called Tried by Fire. And he gives you, the reader, the first 1,000 years of Christianity and from the very writings and words of Christians who have been persecuted through the first 1,000 years. It's a great read of that early great stream of Christian tradition. The Churches of Christ are part of a religious tradition that's been around for almost 200 years and been identified by one of two ways. It's either called the Restoration Movement or the Stone Campbell Movement. The sad thing is that we really need uh, to sort of hone in on this. There is an appalling lack of knowledge of our own history as a religious group and how God brought about the movement to where we are today. And so in order to lay the groundwork for this, even for some future lessons, I want to introduce you to four individuals that typically have been called the pioneers of our restoration movement. Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, Walter Scott, and Barton W. Stone. And we're going to look at just a moment. I'll have probably about three or four quick points as to what each one contributed. And so in this way, hopefully, we'll at least go away this morning with a bird's eye view of our own history and appreciation of how we got to where we are. My first introduction, at least my own awareness of our own history, started when I was about 17 years old. Somehow my father got a hold of a copy of Lewis Cochran's book called The Fool of God. And it's a biographical novel of Alexander Campbell. And the title of that book is called The Fool of God. I don't know exactly how accurate it is, uh, but I do know that for me, it opened the door toward a perspective on our religious identity that I had not had before. And as you know, uh, and I have up here a picture, he was born in 1788, Alexander Campbell was, he was educated in various places, in Glasgow and other places in Ireland. He came to the United States in 1809. Alexander Campbell emphasized that he was working with Christians in all denominations to achieve restoration for the goal of unity. Over time, that desire kind of got flipped around. So that the later followers of Campbell's thinking felt they had to be unified just about the notion of restoration so that it got flipped around. But I want to give you a quick little story about Alexander and how all this started. He was part of a religious group, and are you ready for this? 
And, and I'm, I'm, I've often wondered if this was over the front door of their church building because here was his group. New Light, Anti-Burger, Seceder, Scottish Presbyterian Church. That was his church. He was part of a religious tradition that people could not get along, fiercely independent, and every time a group disagreed about something, they split off and started a new group. And so one Sunday morning, as he is getting ready to take communion, I have a picture here of what's called a communion token. And it's called, we, we call this little episode, The Tale of the Tossed Token. And I think the year 1808, 1809, one Sunday morning, he's getting ready to take communion. And in that day and time, where he was, you had to have a token, which meant that the clergy put you through some sort of examination to make sure that when it came your time to take communion, you were a member in good standing. He got ready to take communion that morning, and he was troubled when he, when, he, when he thought that some of his best friends who were young men in ministry, but they were in different parts of the seceder church, not his part, he recognized that his particular congregation would not allow his best friends to come to the communion table with him that morning. So in disgust, when the uh, plate came to him, he took his token, tossed it in the plate, and he walked out. Now, you know the expression, the shot that was heard around the world, referring to the Revolutionary War. This was the token, clink in the plate, that was heard around the world as people referred to it, which was Alexander Campbell's way of saying, I am sick and tired of all of this religious fighting and division and bitterness and hatred with one group to another. I've had it. So he walks out. That begins his unusual journey toward Christian unity. In 1809, he sailed on the Latonia, name of the ship, landed in New York City on September the 29th, traveled overland to Philadelphia where he met his father, Thomas Campbell, who was already here. And this is where Thomas was serving as a minister in Washington County, Pennsylvania. And at that time, in the early 1800s, that was the frontier. Alexander was ordained by his father at the Brush Run Church on January the 1st, 1812. Four years later, he preaches the famous sermon that I referred to, I think, a couple weeks ago, called the Sermon on the Law. Nobody had ever heard a sermon like that before. Contrasting the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. We're used to that. You've probably heard it all your life. That there's an Old Covenant, we equate it with the Old Testament. There's the New Covenant, we equate it with the New Testament. I don't have time to go into why that's uh, not quite accurate, but at least that's our thinking. Now, when Campbell preached that sermon, it caused such a stir of all the ministers around there that immediately they wanted to toss him out. And they're like, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we, we need to hear him again. Let, let, let's think on this. And it's not until 1846 that he actually writes down the words of the sermon. Now, I've often thought about this. I can't imagine trying to think today, okay, I'm going to write down all the words of a sermon I preached 30 years ago. Now, I'm assuming when he got it to publication in 1846, he probably had improved his thinking a little bit. And with it written down, it was a little bit smoother than it was when he spoke the sermon in 1816. But it had to do with, we're not living under the old covenant law that was for the Jews. We're now under the new covenant with Jesus. And so he was famous for that particular sermon. From 1815 to 1834, Campbell and his father kept the Brush Run Church affiliated with a local Baptist association. Well, there were some disagreements over several things that they were teaching. So they broke ranks with that group and allied themselves with the Mahoning Baptist Association. And from about that time on, Campbell began publishing and writing, and that was and debating too, which he's known for. But in January the 1st, 1832, there was a unity meeting between Barton Stone and those followers of Campbell. In 1840, 
Alexander Campbell founded Bethany College in Bethany, West Virginia. Of course, it was Virginia back then. Some of you may have already gone by and seen Bethany College, still in existence. Campbell believed that every person who stood in the shoes of a preacher needed to be educated. And so out of Bethany College, there were many leaders of Churches of Christ, the Disciples of Christ, and the Christian churches that graduated from that college. And many individuals who graduated from Bethany eventually became presidents themselves of future Christian colleges. Alexander Campbell published The Christian Baptist and The Millennial Harbinger, nearly 50 years of publishing. And he wrote a lot about the restoration of the ancient order of things. For Alexander Campbell, he felt like that the church of his day had gotten into its problems because two or three things were wrong. Number one, there was a strict uh, delineation between clergy and laity. And if we had time, I could read to you, tongue-in-cheek, he pretends in one of his uh, journals that they have found a manuscript called the third epistle of Peter. And in that manuscript, tongue-in-cheek, he talks about how bad the clergy is. And uh, that's, a, that's at a real early date. And that goes way back into the restoration history of the view that the church and the clergy are not the ones to interpret Scripture. There is the freedom of every individual to interpret Scripture. Because of Alexander Campbell's background, he also believed in the practice of open communion, for which we practice today. That when a person comes in on Sunday, we don't really necessarily care where they came from, uh, what church they've come from. Communion is for everyone who comes, and it's between you and God to decide if you want to participate in communion. A lot of churches today still practice closed communion, but many churches associated with the Restoration Movement practice open communion, going back uh, to that particular incident in Campbell's life. Alexander Campbell believed in common sense when it came to Scripture, a belief in the divine order of things, and he believed in what's called the constitutional nature of the inherent authority in Scripture. And this kind of makes sense. It doesn't surprise us. Think of how few years had passed from when our country became a new country based on a declaration of independence and based on um, the Constitution. So they were used to this kind of thinking. And Campbell saw Scripture functioning the same way for uh, the church. Here's a lifelike portrait of Thomas Campbell. He was born and he lived and he came to the United States um, he was born in Scotland, and when he came to the U.S., he published in 1809 a document called Declaration and Address. And many church historians say that this is the historical document which began the Restoration Movement. In this publication, Thomas Campbell held up the cause of Christian unity. He didn't think it was just something that was personally his concern, he said it was self-evident that it should be a common cause, that for the cause of Christ and our brethren of all denominations, everyone needs to stand up for the unity of Christ. Here's the most famous saying out of that document. He actually had 13 based on five broad principles, and again, we don't have time to get into all that, but here's the most famous quote that people quote over and over from the Declaration and Address by Thomas Campbell. The Church of Christ on earth is essentially intentionally and constitutionally one, in which case division is a horrid evil destructive of the visible body of Christ. Local congregations, and he, he used the word societies even, local congregations and societies of Christians are the expression of this one universal church and as such should not be divided from one another but exercise the same mind. Campbell thought that the best way to achieve this kind of unity was a thus saith the Lord. That was his expression over and over. In either express command or approved example. By this way, you could talk about biblical authority. But this idea of approaching biblical authority this way has proved over the years to have some flaws in it. We're aware of that. However, 
It was his attempt to be faithful to the biblical text, trying to find, trying to figure out how to live together as Christians and how to do church when we assemble together. Barton W. Stone is the next individual. He lived from 1772 to 1844. He is known for his famous statement, Christian unity is our polar star. Unity was not the means to an end for Stone. He believed it was the only platform that churches could more powerfully communicate the gospel. And when I read about his life, I think over and over of John 17. If you look at Christian unity from the perspective of Jesus, in John 17, he's very clear. We need to be one as disciples of Jesus so that the world may know Jesus. He's very clear about the foundation and the purpose of unity. Here's a photo of uh, Walter Scott. Well, stop right, uh, go back. <laughs> there you go. I want to say a couple things. He was editor, uh, Barton Stone was editor of the Christian Messenger, co-author of the Last Will and Testament of the Springfield Presbytery, and that was in 1804. Five years before Declaration and Address. And church historians say that's the other document that sort of begins the Restoration Movement. And Barton knows W. Stone was right in the thick of things with that January 1st, 1832 Unity Meeting in Lexington, Kentucky, where everyone who had been baptized and heard the preaching of Stone came together with everyone who knew uh, Alexander and Thomas Campbell had been baptized by them. Huge meeting in 1832. Um, now, let's go to uh, Walter Scott. He is known, he, he lived from 1796 to 1861. He is known for the famous five-finger exercise. While working as an evangelist for the Mahoning Baptist Association between 1827 and 1830, Scott developed a simple way of remembering, a simple illustration for the gospel plan of salvation that has sort of been rooted in our DNA. But Campbell or Scott believed that salvation required faith, repentance, and baptism. And as an evangelist, here was his methodology. He would go into a community. During the daytime, he would find a bunch of children. And sometimes the stories are that he would go to a local schoolhouse. And he would begin to tell children, I want you to hold your hand up. You got five fingers. And I want you to be aware of what each finger stands for. Faith, repentance, baptism, remission of sins, and gift of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes with gift of the Holy Spirit, he would add eternal life. So the fifth one kind of had two parts to it. But once the children learned that on their fingers, he'd send them home, and he'd say, now I want you to tell your parents to come back here tonight because we're going to have a great big revival. And he gained a lot of... Uh, a claim going all over the Western Reserve, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, preaching that way. He was known as the traveling evangelist. Uh, Alexander Campbell was unsure of his success on the frontier. Uh, he, he didn't know what, quite what to make of Barton W. Stone. They differed on some things and what they believed about Jesus and atonement and several things, but Barton W. Stone believed, and he even says, that part of what drew him to the gospel was the biblical teaching, God's love is for all. He said when he saw that, it was like the sunlight of the gospel broke through all of the clouds of the dark tradition that kept him down. And when he began to see the sunlight of God's love, that's what he began proclaiming. And he believed that every person on the face of the earth should have the opportunity to hear about God's love. And that's what drove him in everything that he did. I want to conclude this morning with a story. It's a personal story. It's about a young man named John. Uh, when we lived in Lansing, Michigan, I taught restoration history at Great Lakes Christian College. And one semester in my class was a young man named John. John was unusual because his background had nothing to do with restoration background. He didn't come from a church of Christ. He didn't come from a Christian church. And he didn't come from a disciples of Christ. He came down the road from a church. 
that everybody in town knew it as the church with all the flags. And as you would go by that big church, there was a huge walkway that went from the road straight into the entry doorway of that church. And on either side of that long walkway, there were flags that represented every nation that that church had sent missionaries to. And there were about 50 flags. And it was pretty impressive because they made sure those flags were on really tall poles. And you can imagine just looking at all those different flags waving in the wind from 50 nations from all over the world. So it's quite a spectacle. John came from that church and he took this class on restoration history. And when I would end the class, I would ask individuals, tell me what your response is to the history of the restoration movement. Here's what John's response was as, as he sort of wrote the essay question to his final question. He said, when we first started studying Campbell and Stone and uh, Walter Scott, both Campbells, he said, the vision of the original pioneers was so exciting to me, I couldn't believe that people thought like that. But then he said, as we kept on studying, and we got up to about the year 1950, he said, for 100 years, it looks like it went from a unity movement to a divisive movement. And he said, it's strange to me that the people who started historically as a people for Christian unity became, it looks like to me, one of the most divided groups in all of Christian history. Well, he sort of exaggerated, we're not the most divided, but we're, we're up there. And that just really struck me. He said, I admire their spirit, but I don't have anything to do with the churches connected with it today. That was so sad to me. And of course, coming from an outsider, I had to listen to that critique. We need to really understand what our history is. It began with a call to Christian unity. Now, because of that, I wanna end with five questions quickly and the lesson is yours. And as we've done in the past, I invite your feedback. Question number one, how important is Christian unity and what part can Highland View play in that ongoing quest? Is it indeed our polar star? Number two, what does it mean for our own religious identity to see ourselves as today as part of the universal church? Which sets the stage for question number three, are we willing to admit that there are Christians in other denominations? Number four, are we willing to cooperate and fellowship with other Christians? And number five, do we have a personal testimony for our own salvation, dynamic and real enough to share with others if we think that the five finger exercise isn't quite adequate enough to talk about salvation? It was interesting, it really served Walter Scott really well but if we think that that's a little bit, um, what word do I want to use? Maybe too packaged up a little too neatly. What are you using? What am I using to tell people about Jesus? Leading them to a life commitment. I'm always amazed how it's so easy. And think about how we all, we all fall prey to this. It's easy to critique something and tell people why something isn't good or we don't like it. It's quite another to step up to the plate and replace it with something better, isn't it? So, so you may not like Walter Scott's five finger exercise, that's okay, but my challenge to you is, have you got something better? What have you been using to lead people to Christ? So this, our history is an amazing history. And I've just given you a teeny little thumbnail sketch of 42 years of my journey in our history. Some of this may not be new to some of you, some of it, it might be, but I want to encourage you to begin reading a little bit more about our own history. What are we about? And it reminds me of John 17, where Jesus is just so clear about the unity of his followers. It gives God glory and it gives power. Think about this. It gives power to the witness of Christians to an unbelieving world. If you need to come to Christ today and you haven't done that, our call and our plea is that you be one with God and Christ in the spirit and one with his people. And that the challenge maybe for the rest of us is to think in terms, what's the biblical view of the kingdom? Where have I maybe in my mind been drawing lines I shouldn't have? What do I need to be doing to connect with other people who claim to be Christians? How do I discuss things with others who see things a little differently than I do? But what about all of that? How does the mind of Christ play into that big picture? 
What a great challenge for each of us. If you need to come forward this morning to follow Jesus, let this be your moment when we stand and sing.